going to give you a little bit of my background and my testimony, which is going to be we weaved through all of this because, boy, that light is bright, <laughs> um, which is going to be weaved through all of this because um, of the power of God to just transform our lives and set us free and break strongholds and lies. Um, and, you know, it's interesting when you write your testimony or when you're asked to kind of share your testimony and you remember, because I got saved at 15 and a half, and you look back and you go, my gosh, I didn't realize how much God, you know, and it's good for us to do that. So I highly recommend, you know, even if you've been saved one year or 20 years, you know, such a good practice to go back and say, Lord, you know, let me just bring me in remembrance of all that you've done in my life. Um, anyway, so I got saved at 15 and a half, um, was raised in a religious background, but um, the type of church that really did, it didn't teach about being born again. It was more about works. It was more about kind of earning your way to God. Um, I had a fear of God and, and a belief in God, but no intimacy. There was a complete void. Um, I remember um, one day crying out to the Lord, going, you know, and I was very social, outgoing, but very insecure and covered up my insecurities very well. So no one knew I was insecure, but I knew it and God knew it. And um, before I accepted Christ, I remember crying out to God saying, you know, in the quietness of my room, I just want a real friend. And I had lots of friends, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes we don't realize what we're crying out for before we're saved is a real friend, you know, and um, something that feels completely secure and um, safe. And um, so before I got saved, you know, I remember crying out to God for that. And so there was this lack in, in my religious upbringing of not having intimacy with Christ, knowing who he was, but, you know, really having no clue what, who he was. So at 15 and a half, um, a neighbor took us to the Billy Graham crusade. The night before, I was in a Baptist parking lot getting drunk. And the next night, I'm on, um, in a car with a neighbor going to, a um, to hear Billy Graham. Went clear to the top of the stadium. It was at um, Qualcomm Stadium. Went clear to the top row of the stadium. Cigarettes in my back pocket <laughs> and rebellion. And by the end of that, I knew I had heard what my heart had been crying out for and that friend that my heart was seeking. And so I went from the top all the way to the bottom to the floor and, and um, got saved. Um, so I'm going to fast forward a couple years. Um, well, in between that, um, I left the church that I was at, got on a bike, and just started checking out churches. Um, ended up in a church that, you know, really was grounded in teaching about being born again and that kind of thing, but never really heard who I was in Christ and my authority as a believer. And maybe some of you are here and you're going, I don't even get what your authority of Christ is or who you are in Christ, you know, that kind of terminology. Um, so when you don't understand the Word of God, and as a new believer, you're not going to understand the Word of God, Satan will sideswipe you and um, in your ignorance. So, you know, I'm a new Christian. Um, I'm not in a church that's teaching very solidly in the Word, and so I'm not very grounded. And so when this guy comes along and kind of sweeps me off my feet and, you know, and I'm kind of at a backslidden stage, um, I fall for him. And it's very easily to get unequally yoked if you don't know how precious you are to God. So, you know, you, you, you get saved, but you still kind of have your old patterns, and God has to gradually change that. So I got in this relationship, um, ended up marrying him. Um, he was verbally abusive even before we got married. Um, but right before that happened, I turned back to the Lord and decided to cut the relationship off because... I'll just be blunt. I didn't want to sleep with him anymore. I knew that what we were doing was wrong, the way we were living, my partying and all that kind of stuff. And so I cut the relationship off, but he turned to the Lord. And so what I thought was had a true conversion. Um, and because I was kind of young in the Lord, I didn't discern that it was more because he didn't want to lose me. Um, so I ended up marrying him. That lasted nine years. And really God used it to bring me to a breaking point because you know, we can think that our contentment is going to come from a man. I think every woman, especially if you're a new Christian or um, if you're not, you think that I'll be happy if I find the right guy. I'll be happy if I find the right job. I'll be happy if whatever, name it, whatever, you know, I wear the right clothes. You know, I have this degree, whatever it is. Um, and really true happiness can't come until you 
completely surrender to Christ. And so God had to bring me to a breaking point, in a sense, to where my husband doesn't treat me right, you know, I'm not happy. I battled depression, up and down depression. People didn't really know, but I knew. And I kind of came to a place where I broke, and I went to see this counselor, a young guy at a church, um, who basically just shared some scriptures with me. And it was like that time where God said, you're saved, but you haven't made me Lord of your life. And, and I completely surrendered. And this book that had been like a duty, and I don't know if any of you are here and you feel like, you know, I'm a Christian, I have to read my Bible, this is what I need to do, and, it, and it's like a duty, and it feels like a weight. Um, and that's how it was. And, and prior to that, I'd see people like in a worship service, and I'd think, what do they have that I don't And I'm saved. I'm thinking, what do they have that I don't have? Because I don't have that contentment and peace that I sense in that person or you know what I mean so all of a sudden I just say I surrender and and Satan will lie to you and say if you completely surrender everything to the Lord he's going to take your fun he's going to ask you to go to Timbuktu Um, you know I'm being exaggerating but you know we get these thoughts like if I really fully surrender I'm going to have to give up this this and this and I'm not going to have any fun anymore. That's such a lie. It's such a lie because what God gives you is so much better than what the world and any kind of happiness you have in the world. So I came to that point, um, surrendered my heart. The next morning, literally, this book came alive. I mean, it leapt. Scriptures left, leapt off the pages. It started speaking to me. And Hebrews 4 I'm going, to turn, I'm going to end up turning to a lot of scripture because really my testimony is the power of what this has done in my life. And for me, when I started really studying this and finally got in a church that really started teaching the word, um, for me, when I started hearing these truths, um, it would kind of be in my head and I'd believe it because it's God's word. But part of me would go like, I don't know. You know, some of the truths I was hearing, it's like, It would be in my head, but it would take time of me really meditating on that scripture for it to drop into my heart and become rhema and change my life. And so my testimony is really the sword of the spirit, the power of this word to completely change somebody who looked like they had it all together, but knew inside they didn't. And one of my biggest fears, I'll just share this with you, for, because when I was a kid, I was in the slow reading group and I believed this lie that I was dumb. I was, I don't know what grade you're in, first, second grade, and you get put in reading groups. And I was in, I knew it was a slow reading group. And I remember right, dry, um, walking home that day and going, and you know, now I know the enemy was lying to me and saying, you're dumb. But back then you just think, you're dumb. You know, you believe these thoughts. And it carried through until my mid-20s when God started setting me free of that. But one of my biggest fears was even sometimes, let's say, um, I was talking to Sharon, and as she was talking, I'm like, she's so smart, she has a college degree, if I open my mouth, she's going to realize I'm stupid, that kind of thing, even one-on-one. So speaking in front of more than one person was my greatest fear. So speaking in front of you is the power of God to transform a life. So um, Hebrews, sorry, I'm, I'm scatterbrained, I have a lot, a ton of notes, but... <laughs> Half the time I don't go by them. So um, if you'll turn to Hebrews, if you have your Bible or um, your cell phone. I'm old school. I, like, love my pages in the Bible. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to jump up to Hebrews 4 and um, verse 2 and 3 and then jump down to 11, I think, through 12. It says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. You know, so when we begin to believe the word of God and what God says about us, it begins to bring rest to our souls because it begins to undo the lies that we've maybe believed. If I don't have a degree, if I'm not this, if I'm not that, if I'm not married, then I'm not worth much. And, that, and that's a lie. And, you know, we've all believed different kinds of lies. And some of us are like super educated and super confident, but the Lord's just wanting to break us and break the pride and say, hey, you know, you think you have it all together, but 
I want to work on this part, and I want you to surrender this part to me. Kind of like Sean, Shanti shared last night, you know, you've given me your heart, but give me your mind. Um, and then verse... Um, I'm going to skip down to verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, when we read the word of God, it's supposed to divide as we meditate on it between what's in our soul and what's in our spirit. In other words, what's of God? Because we're spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. We're, th we're like, there's the Trinity, there's three parts to us. We are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. So we're, our soul tries to rule and reign us, right? Our mind, will, and emotions. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. Our mind, will, and emotions want to rule us. But God created us, if you're born again, to be led by the spirit, right? But that's easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> because our emotions, like these lies, these thoughts, this, you know, whatever it is, I'm not good enough, you're not going to be able to speak in front of the ladies, whatever the thought is, wants to, wants to um, rule us. But when, when, we, when we believe and stand on the word, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even if I do it in fear and trembling, I'm stepping out of the boat, and I'm going to do what God's called me to do, whatever that is. So what started happening is God's word started dividing in my heart and in my life between soul and spirit, and it became a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians. Um, I better turn to my notes. <laughs> I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5, I believe. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of telling you um, what, how God used his word to transform my life, to get me to a place that I could believe God for his best, because I was married. Sorry if I jump around a little bit, but I was married for nine years to my first husband. He was very verbally abusive, um, began to ha was raised by an alcoholic father, had typical dysfunctional family. I was raised by a very healthy family. We all got saved about the same time, but even before they were saved, you know, my dad was this awesome guy. You know, a lot of times they'll say, you're going to be drawn to somebody like your dad. Not always. If you have a lot of insecurity, um, you know, why would me coming from a healthy um, um, family marry some guy that was being verbally abusive to me? Why? I had an awesome dad. He wasn't verbally abusive to my mom. And the Lord began to show me many years later, you didn't know who you were in Christ. You didn't know how much I loved you. And because you didn't know your worth, you settled for what the enemy dangled. And so it's so important that we know our worth as a woman, as a single woman, because when you begin to know um, and really daily remind yourself of who you are in Christ, you're not going to settle for, God, for second best. You're going to be able to say, you know what? I'm God's princess. The Bible says I'm a king and a priest in God's kingdom. Um, I have authority over the enemy, and I'm going to believe God for his best. And if, you're, if you have in your heart to get married again, you know, if that's God's will for your life, he's going to bring you an amazing man of God. I can testify. But you want it in his timing. And so, you know, there's going to be a lot of, I say, there's in, in Genesis, um, the story, I don't know if you know the story of Abraham and Sarah and how God promised um, that, him a son, and it ended up happening way later than they thought when it looked completely impossible, but he waited. But in the meantime, they got a little bit in the flesh and they had an Ishmael by the flesh, but then God's so gracious, he's like, no, that wasn't the one. And so that story really ministered to me as a single woman. And I said, you know what, this time I've had the Ishmael. I've had what I, I had by the flesh. Now I want what's by the Spirit. So I will wait until God brings me the one by the Spirit. I'll stay single the rest of my life if I will not go through another divorce. And so, you know, but I had to find out how precious I was to God and that he wanted the best for me and that I believed that in my heart, just not in my head. And when you believe that in your heart, you won't settle. 
I believe, especially if you surround yourself with friends that are encouraging you, you make yourself accountable, you have kind of a covering over you. I would, as I was single, I would go to um, godly friends, my pastor and his wife, my dad and different ones, you know, hey, what do you think, you know, about this guy or whatever, um, and run that past because I realized I had enough of the fear of God to know you know what, in my natural flesh, I could end up stumbling and falling for a wolf in sheep's clothing. But if I keep myself accountable and humble and stay in the word and stay in God's presence, I'm going to have the one God has for me. And, and I believed God um, had marriage for me again. Um, I have so much. I have, I have so much in my testimony. But in, anyway, let me go back to, uh, let's see, it was 2 Corinthians. Sorry, you guys. I hope you can track with me. <laughs> um, 2 Corinthians. So after I went through the divorce, um, that's hard. How many of you guys here have been through a divorce? Okay, so it's hard. And, if, and how many of you guys were single or are single parents? So you know it's not fun. <laughs> and even if you have a really good support system. Um, so I, I went into it at a place where I had fully surrendered and I had begun to understand the word of God, um, and had began to learn how to take my thoughts captive. Um, but still, you're not prepared. I never thought I would be divorced. There was a never divorce in my family prior to this, first divorce, um, two kids, three and five. And um, there's, there's just key things that God did a lot. First of all, he started showing me my identity. And when this happened and he asked me for a divorce, um, I was in a pretty solid place spiritually to be able to, you know, trust him and not be an idiot like the, in the past and, you know, hit the bars or whatever. You know, I, I knew enough about God's love for me that I, I, I just went to him, went to his feet. Um, and I remember after my, after my husband asked me for a divorce, that night I um, took off in my car, bawling, went up to the top of Mount Soledad and um, was just crying and crying out to God and said, God, you know, just praying for my marriage, you know, wanting to believe for it to be restored. And I heard what I feel like sounded like an audible voice. I don't know, but it sounded audible to me. And he said, I knew it was God. I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. And so I thought, okay, he's going to restore this marriage, you know. Um, fast forward, he didn't, but he did give me the desires of my heart, and I do have a godly marriage now. Um, I didn't know his timing, and I didn't know that's what he meant, but we just have to trust what he says. Um, and then fast forward maybe a year down the line, you know, six months down the line, here I am, two little kids, um, driving down the free one one day, Father, I can't be, you know, crying. I can't be both mother and father. And I had been putting God's word in my heart. Um, and he said back to me, my favorite chapter in the Bible the whole time I was single was Isaiah 54. And there's a verse in Isaiah 54, and there were so many nuggets in there. It talks about the Lord your maker is your husband. God Almighty is his name. Um, and, but there's another verse that says, and I will teach your children, and great shall be their peace. And so as I'm crying out to God, saying I can't be both mother and father, he says, Vicki, I haven't called you to be both mother and father. And then he quotes that scripture back to me. I will teach your children, and great shall be their peace. So it gave me that comfort that, okay, my children will walk with the Lord, and because you can't have great peace unless you're walking with the Lord. Um, I will tell you, I have two kids. I have three kids, one, two by birth, and, and, and another one by marriage. And, um, and a son-in-law, and um, two of them are walking with the Lord, and two aren't right now, but I still cling to that promise that God gave me over 20 years ago. He, he spoke it. I don't know when it will come to pass, but at some point in time, the other two will turn to the Lord. And so we have to cling to his promises even when we don't see. But, I, but um, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So 
One day I'm walking, um, it's probably three or four years down the line as a single parent, and i am got these thoughts, ever been there? <laughs> You're just like, oh, ah. and I'm battling the roller coaster of emotions. And another example of why it's so important, you put his word in your heart, because as I'm walking and going, oh my gosh, you know, and um, just crying out to God, he, he quotes back to me, uh, um, Hebrews 4, um, 12, about God's word dividing between soul and spirit. And he says, Vicki, are these thoughts that you're having right now of the soul or of the spirit? In other words, are they lining up with my word or are they lining up with your emotions, your mind, will, and emotions? And right there, it's like I went, no, I'm feeling condemnation. I'm feeling like a loser. Say, God doesn't correct his daughters with condemnation, with oppression, with you're a loser. You don't see that in here. A good father, even if our natural father did that, a good father, our father, corrects his daughters with, you know, kind discipline. Yes, he corrects us. Yes, he disciplines us. But it's not by condemning us. So if you're feeling like pressed down, oppressed, I can't get out of this. I can't get under, out of this heaviness. That's not God. That's Satan trying to hold you back from God's plans for your life. So I realized, So immediately I said, no, it's of the soul. So then he said this. Take your thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. Cast down these vain imaginations. Command them to leave. You have authority over your thoughts. Tell these thoughts to go. So I'm like, okay, I command these thoughts to go in Jesus' name. And Father, and you say, and I started speaking, you say, I don't know exactly what I said, but you say I'm chosen. You say I'm an overcomer. You say I can do all things through Christ. You know, you say I'm loved unconditionally not based on what I do. So it's so important, whatever stage you're at, take your thoughts captive. Begin to know, is this God? Is this not God? You know, even, okay, a guy comes across your path. If you know the word of God, you know you're not supposed to be unequally yoked. So you don't have to pray about, is this guy for me? He's not for you. The Bible says not to be unequally yoked to, with unbelievers. Why? God's not trying to blow your fun. God loves you, and he wants the best. He wants you to have a husband that you can pray with. He doesn't want you going through the heartache that maybe you've experienced through a bad relationship or a bad marriage. So, you know, he doesn't tell us not to have sex before marriage because he's trying to blow our fun. He tells us because he knows the amazing blessing it will be if we do it his way, which I've done both. I did it one way the first time. Can I be blunt? Lousy sex life. I did it. I waited till my wedding night. 18 years. It's a long time to wait, and I'm not a non-sexual person. I just chose that I want God's best, and I've seen the opposite. Like, he's healed my hang-ups. <laughs> I have an amazing marriage bed. I have an amazing husband. Um, something that I thought could never be good is awesome, and, um, because, and I know it's as a result of I trusted him that he set these boundaries for me. And then I put, I put guards, you know, like I guarded. I'm like, okay, I want to stay pure. I, I don't need to watch these movies that are going to stir up, you know, and I'm not talking porn. And if you're dealing with porn, get free. God wants to set you free. But anything, your mind, if I would watch people kissing passionately on a movie, it would get me stirred up. I don't need to watch that, you know? So, or music, you know, a lot of secular music would just take my brain down and I'd start getting depressed. I'm like, I don't need this message. So I would put on, you know, Christian worship music that would draw me out of that and up thinking on things above. So, and that's not being legalistic. That's guarding your heart. That's guarding God's plan and purpose for your life. So, um, hmm, thank you, Lord, show me. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. Um, so, okay, we're good. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> I have so much in my, um, really neat things, practical things, like when I, when, I, when I became a single parent, you know, I had previously learned about tithing. And here you are, all of a sudden, this money gets yaked. You know what I mean? And I got very little child support, and getting any, getting any was just miraculous anyway. But I laid before the Lord, I remember um, right after he left, laying before the Lord my finances and saying, I trust you, and your word says to tithe, and you'll open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there won't be room enough to, to, um, to contain it. Um, I was able to... God said, test me in this, and 
I mean, I had in my heart to have my kids in Christian school. Well, now I'm a single mom. How am I going to afford that? I won't go into what he did, but supernaturally my kids were in Christian school. I have no college education. I don't have this great job. I work in cosmetics. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and that's the job that I had at the time, and, you know, I wasn't rich. So supernaturally, he provided tuition. I'll never know. There were years that he naturally did it, and there were years there was anonymous, you know. I told God, me and my little daughter would pray, and I'd say, if you're supposed to go there again next year, God will provide. Where he guides, he provides. So if it's his will for you to stay there, the money will come in. And I saw the power of believing God, you know, tithing. Okay, now I'm a single mom. I still do this, God? Do I have the ability to do this? Yes. Try. He says, try me now in this. So it's just awesome. I just like these things that can be so scary, you know, as a single mom, trusting him with your love life, trusting him with your kids, trusting him with your finances. There was nothing in his word that he didn't prove to me faithful. And I went through hard seasons. Um, a couple years before I remarried, um, I basically experienced dating a wolf in sheep's clothing. I would go like three, four, five years in between any kind of date. So I really just felt like, God, I don't want to date anybody unless it's the person that's going to be my husband. And that was my mindset. I'm like, I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to have my heart broken, and I don't want to break anybody else's heart. So I would go three, four years without a date, and then I did have in 18 years a few relationships. Um, but this one guy I met at the church I was going to basically ended up being a wolf in sheep's clothing, and they can disguise themselves pretty good. You need to see some good fruit. <laughs> and, um, you know, I started to see some signs, and I began to pray, and we were out one night, and... Um, I started getting just like, I felt like I was going to throw up and went to the bathroom and I thought, I got to go home. I thought I got the 24-hour flu that night. I ended up starting battling anxiety. The enemy just brought this anxiety against me and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm like, what's going on? I know how to take my thoughts captive. I know what to do. You know, what's going on here? And um, I went through a season of the enemy really coming against me and where I felt like this heavy oppression would come over me and um, just weigh me down with oppressive thoughts and depression and anxiety, not really panic attacks because I've heard what, that described differently from what I experienced, but, uh, you know, and it didn't lift as quick as I wanted it to. I wanted it gone like day one. Um, it, 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 there was a season, and um, through it all, I, I can see that God... He didn't do it because he doesn't do that. The enemy does that, but he's used it for more compassion because I think there's more women that struggle and people that struggle with that than we're aware of. Um, but I continued to do what I knew to do, take my thoughts captive. I continued to come to the Lord. I continued to worship, and he continued to get me through and um, to where pretty much, I mean, I had a little bit of anxiety this morning, and then it lifted, and I said, Satan, you're not doing this. I will say what God wants me to say today, and, and you're not going to stop me, and even a little anxiety is not going to keep me from obeying God. So, but, so I just tell myself the truth, you know, and I speak to that mountain, and I command it to leave. Sometimes it goes right away. Sometimes I just have to step out in faith and obey God even if it's still there. And um, that's the whole getting out of the boat. I'm sure when, was it Peter that was got, Jesus said, come out on the water? I'm sure no one had ever walked on water. He was a little scared, but we don't grow unless we step out a little scared and say, okay, you said I could do this and I'm going to obey you, even if it's in fear and trembling, right? So that's how we grow. So we, we take him at his word. Um, let me see. I, there's certain key scriptures I really want to hit on. Isaiah 54. So this was my favorite chapter in the Bible um, as a single woman because so many things spoke to my heart and strengthened me out of this. And so I want to share some of what spoke to me um, out of it. Um, verse 4. So I'm going to skip around a little bit, but verse 4 and 5. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. 
He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says the Lord. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. I'm going to skip down a little bit, but I really encourage you to meditate on these scriptures. For my, verse 10, For my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. And verse 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. And there's so much in here that we could do like a really long Bible study. But, um, you know, he wants us and to break us free of the shame of our youth. Whether we brought that shame on us, whether our father, our husband, a boyfriend bought that shame on us, just the lies of the enemy, God's will for you, for me, is to break us free of the shame of our youth and to break every bondage, everything that's held us from God's plan for our life. He wants to break it all off, and he will if we'll let him. Um, and, you know, the Lord your maker is your husband. That can be like, whoa, okay, how does that become a reality? And a husband is supposed to, supposed to be a protector, a provider, a confidant. We're supposed to have intimacy, right? Um, that's how it's supposed to be in marriage. And we can have that with Jesus. And I saw that become a reality. And I knew for myself, God did not want me getting married again until I was content without a man. And to, uh, to where I was secure enough in my love in him that I felt like I don't need a man to be happy. And he wants us in that place because he is the only one in a marriage or without a marriage that can truly fill that place. Um, and I saw him protect me. I mean, even I, over the years, have been involved in different ministries. And I remember going into scary neighborhoods because I felt like God called me to do this certain thing and knowing supernaturally God's protecting me in this. Um, my provider, I shared with you, you know, like, tithing and all that, supernaturally provided for me. We just have to ask and obey. Um, intimacy. I mean, we need intimacy, and that's why we sometimes fall into wrong relationships, because you're just lonely, and you just want a guy. You just want somebody there. He wants to fill that. Let him fill it his way. He'll give you amazing girlfriends um, if it's his will, and I believe if the desire in your heart is to be remarried, and he's put that desire in, in you, he'll, he'll give you the desires of your heart. I saw one lady at a church that I went to. These two people, one of them had never been married. God put them together at like 70 years old. You know, I mean, nothing's too hard for him. You could think, I'm 70. It's too late. The statistics are I'll never get married again. If he wants you married, he'll bring you a widow or whatever at 70. So, but his timing is so amazing. So, but that need for intimacy is so real. And um, I shared this with Linda. Um, I remember like putting my kids to bed and you know, you, you, know you, you have your times where you're feeling kind of lonely or you need that intimacy. And I would just put my kids to bed, light candles like you would do, you know, if you're being, and put on whatever worship music was ministering to me at the time. And I just, I have this picture right now of this one time where, and, can, and some of you, this might sound kind of wacky, but I want to share it because it was very real, and it's just how our father is, um, and him being a husband. So I go in my kitchen, I light candles, I put worship music on, and I just started worshiping, and then I felt like, almost like the Lord just wrapped his arms around me and was almost like dancing with me, not in a weird, you know, way, but him just pouring his love and just, I love you, and I'm going to, you know, and meeting that need for intimacy and his love feeling so real that it's like, wow, if I can w continue to walk in this, and you don't always feel it every day, but you can have, he wants to be real that way. So, um, and he wants us to pour our heart out to him like you want to pour out your heart to a husband if, if you have a healthy marriage. And, and I can do that now, and I could not. My first marriage I don't think I probably got a compliment one or two times in nine years. This marriage, I wake up in the morning, I look terrible. My husband tells me I'm beautiful. I mean, just things, the part of my body I hated the most, I got a bubble butt, I hated it. I always wanted to be one of those ladies with a flat butt. Why can't I have jeans that sag off of my butt? I hated it. 
I mean, I might be being too real. This husband, when he brings you, he, like, he likes everything about me. But, you know, he, he likes the part I hated the most, you know. So, sorry if I'm being too... <laughs> We're girls. Okay, so anyway... Um, um, and also, verse 11, O oh, you afflicted one, tossed with temp- tempest and not comforted. Sometimes we feel like we're not comforted. And the Lord says, Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies and your gates of crystal and all your wa- walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. And you know what? I, I've, in the last several months, really been meditating on righteousness because we can feel like, and especially my background is very works-oriented, um, I have to remind myself, and something that's really been helping me with anxiety lately is I have to remind myself that I'm saved by faith through grace, not of myself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, the next verse is we're created for works, but God first wants to lay a foundation of you can't do it without me. So your righteousness, our righteousness, your righteousness is not of you. It's of the Lord. Um, So we're made right, right standing with God because of what he did. And part of what he did is he also gave us a covenant of peace. So when my peace is not there, I remind the enemy, I have a covenant of peace purchased with the blood of Jesus. I mean, in the blood of Jesus, Isaiah 53, I think I put that here. Isaiah 53 talks about what Jesus did on the cross and prophesied what he was going to do. And it's basically, it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Griefs actually means sicknesses in the Hebrew. And carried our sorrows, which means our pains. Um, we have, yet we have esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions or our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Basically, this is a picture of Christ's atonement on the cross, paying for our healing, both spiritually, our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, which is based in us having peace in our mind, and our body healing for our body. And I know sometimes we don't see that, but he paid for it, you know, and we need to stand and contend for what Jesus purchased. So um, it's so important um, that we know our identity as single women um, so that we're not sideswiped. Um, another really foundational scripture um, for me, I hope I'm not talking too fast, <laughs> um, Ephesians chapter 1, um, the book of Ephesians, I highly recommend you meditate in it because it can completely revolutionize your, your life and your identity. Um, the first part of the book of Ephesians, basically, if you feel like you struggle with insecurity and, you know, um, identity or, you know, believing lies, meditate in the first book of Ephesians, especially the first part, and put your name in it. For example, it says... First of all, it opens to Paul, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus. The saints are Christians. So first of all, you're a saint. We can just, I'm a sinner. No, the Bible, when you become born again, calls you a saint. Yes, you sin sometimes, but your identity is you're a saint. You sin sometimes, but your identity is no longer I'm a sinner. Your identity is I'm a saint. Yes, I sin sometimes. But when you start seeing yourself the way God sees you, it starts changing the way you think. And when you start seeing yourself, I'm a saint, well, then let me act like what God calls me. You know what I mean? So if I'm chosen, if I'm an heir, if I'm predestined, which this all talks about, if I'm redeemed, if I'm forgiven, when you start really believing that I'm forgiven, I'm the righteousness of God, I'm chosen, and maybe you're feeling like, no, I wasn't chosen, Um, somebody wanted to abort me, you know? No, you were chosen by God. You were chosen by God and ordained by him. And so we have to tell ourselves, I have a destiny. I've been adopted by the son. And, and, and for me, maybe you guys are super secure in yourself, but for me, I have to remind myself, that's who I am. And when the enemy comes and says, you blew it again, you talk to your husband that way, you call yourself you know, a Christian or whatever, I'm like, you know, Father, I repent. I'm sorry. I repent to my husband. And then I have to remind myself, this is who I am. 
and I'm being sanctified, I'm being set apart, and I'm, I'm going through that process, and yeah, I blew it, but it doesn't change my identity in Christ. So, um, let me see. Also, um, you know, Ephesians 6 talks about the, that we battle not with flesh and blood. As Shanti talked about last night, you know, there's a two spirit realms, very real. And, and um, to know how to fight in that spirit realm, we've got to know how to use the armor of God. How many of you guys, have you guys all read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 talks about the armor of God? Um, you know, when I was younger, I thought, okay, that means I have to say I'm putting on the belt of truth, and okay, I'm using the sword of the Spirit. Really what it is, it, it all connects to the Word of God, and it's not like saying really that stuff over us, but it's like an action of, okay, if I'm going to be a soldier in God's army, and I'm going to win in the war that's not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities, then um, I have to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I need myself girded up with the truth, which is the Word of God. I need to remind myself that I have the breastplate of righteousness to guard my heart and to guard my soul from the lies that are coming. I need to remind myself that I have a covenant of peace, helmet of salvation, so my feet are, I mean, you know, girded with peace. And I need to use the sword of the Spirit offensively against the lies of the enemy. So, you know, Ephesians 6, 10 through um, uh, 20 talks about that. Um, okay, and then this morning, I don't think I did anything pretty much. <laughs> um, this morning, um, I mean, last night um, before I went to bed, um, I felt like the Lord led me to this scripture. I wasn't even anywhere near this, and he was speaking it to me, but then he's after which it ministered to me, I felt like he said, I want it to you to minister this to, to the ladies, and it's Jeremiah. So, you know, you guys, you know the little cliche, God has a plan and purpose for our life. I mean, we need to think about those little cliches and not let the enemy make them little cliches, because it's the truth. God has a plan and purpose for each of our lives, and it's, it's real and it's true, and we need to, like, take that seriously. Um, so I want to read something to you from Jeremiah 1, um, 4 through 10, and I want you to personalize it. And some of the words you'll have to transpose because in verse 5 it says, I've ordained you a prophet to the nations. Well, you might not be called a prophet to the nations, but you're called and you're ordained because ordained means you're appointed. So he has an appointment for you. And so, you know, in the word we have to sometimes transpose that, but... So um, maybe close your eyes and just listen to this and let the Lord minister this to you and, and as he's speaking to you. Then the word of the Lord came to you saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you or I set you apart. I ordained you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to whom I send you, and wherever I com whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and to throw down to build and to plant. And I believe what the Lord is partially saying to you is whatever I've called you to, whatever I've ordained to, for your life, you can accomplish, you can do. I will put the words in your mouth. I will gift you. And I will also teach you how to root out and pull down what the enemy has tried to root into you and has tried to take you out with. And I will show you how to build and to plant that which I desire to have built and planted in you. And I've given you authority to cast down the lies of the enemy and to cast down the vain imaginations and to root out and command God what the enemy has tried to bring against your life. And you can receive by my spirit my best and what I've called you to 
because you are a daughter of the king. I've called you a king and a priest. You're called to rule and reign with me and to intercede and to be an overcomer. And that's by the blood of the lamb and by the word of my testimony. And you can do it because you're a mighty woman of God. So I just feel like, anyway, I don't know what our time is, but um, I, yeah, five minutes. Okay, so I, I would like to end, um, I'm going to pray, and then could we, there's two songs that I had in my heart, and I think I'm going to um, have them play a song that um, has been ministering to me. It's like in a form of a prayer. And so if you would just, after I pray, new wine, that's the one. I'm going to have you play New Wine. Um, maybe just, if you want, just get before the Lord and, and, and worship in the form of a prayer with this song. Um, if you don't know it, I think just let it minister to you. So, Father, thank you so much for each lady that's here. And I pray that you spoke to each of them because um, it's not me. So I pray that there was a seed from your word that touched some part of their life and that the plans and purposes that you have for them will be accomplished and the lies that maybe they've been believing or the second best, third best or whatever that's not the best for their life that they've been settling for, you would expose and they would say no more. I'm going to walk in God's plan and purpose and his destiny. I pray any lie of the enemy would be exposed to them. They would take it captive and they would bring it in, in, um, captive in obedience to Christ, to you, Lord. And they would have your plans and purposes, your best for their life. I pray blessing over their children, the ones that are wayward. May they come back in Jesus' name. Um, that what you've put in these ladies' hearts, that you would give them as they seek you. You said if we seek first your kingdom, you will give us the desires of our heart. We trust you for that, Father, because you're a good father. We just thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name.